Sure, also. sure. So yeah, like that, that, that stuff is totally going to work, 100%. Uh, the leader in that right now is Sony. PlayStation yeah. VR has a lot of asymmetrical multiplayer, and it's because the default experience has that TV pass through, right. which is really brilliant. I'm really glad they did that instead of you know having to be switched between the two. Having that TV pass through has led to so many cool games being made, and it's going to keep happening. Like where you have people that are using the TV and normal controllers, and then a player in VR. Uh, yeah. yeah, that stuff's well, really social, cool. The, social zero point five or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really cool. I think like for QLAB maybe it's maybe a false, but the higher resolution is maybe from, from the experience what I got with normal people using the headsets mm -hmm. the last five years and getting better all the time. Like, like your resolution is every complaining about like the resolution. I think like that should be the, the first QLAB when you get hardware, it's a higher resolution hardware. I think for the normal people, it's that the, the, the trigger point where they say, yeah, it's cool yep. and really cool. And then it's like, oh, okay, it's so much more emotional for them. I think maybe it's, I'm wrong with that one, but. I, I think what I think thinking right now it could change in the future. I, don't I think know. you're right. It, like that is one of the biggest factors because right now, VR is better than traditional gaming in so many ways. Yeah, but is. there are also points where you can like clearly say, it is worse. Like this is worse resolution. This looks worse than my monitor. Once you can overcome that, there's actually not that many things left where you can yeah. say, this is worse than playing a game and on a monitor. And it's so unique now, right? Because when like the iPhone came out, for example, you didn't have something that was infinitely better mm -hmm. than it. It was just solving a different problem. Right. VR is solving the immersion problem, but it's having to take a step back in, in the graphics where everybody's expecting 4K. Everybody's sure. expecting IMAX level clarity of all this stuff. So yeah, we're definitely chicken before the egg, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the, the way that all of this worked out is that the Rift became right. viable largely because high resolution mobile panels became available. And so we were kind of, streamlining off of that technology. You know, we were able to copy a lot of stuff that was being used. The problem is that we've run out of that investment. Like, <laughs> we're now at the point where we're as advanced or more advanced than any of those phone panels. Any new advancements have to be built from scratch, right. uh, working with the display with the display manufacturers. So those easy gains <laughs> of like, oh, look, we were going from 720p, oh, now we're 1080p, oh, and now we're even higher resolution. Like, it just keeps going. Like, that, that was the only reason that happened is because we were basically catching up to the state of the art <laughs> right. in mobile phone displays. Yeah. And then, you know, barely surpassing it because you have to do things like global illumination and, uh, and low persistence. But it is going to be like a harder slog out here. Like, we're not going to have annual resolution doublings, which is kind of a bummer. Come on! Yeah, wait, waiting for Samsung to set 2015, like the 4K mobile yep. phone display 2015. They would never like to announce. Well, so, I mean, still waiting for that the, one. Re even, remember, even that like having a 4K mobile display doesn't necessarily mean that it would work for VR. A lot of these panels yeah. are truly pushing the limits of the chemistry that's available right now, and they're barely able to hit like 60 hertz mm -hmm. with significant display artifacts that you won't notice on a phone that become immediately apparent when you use a VR headset. So, a lot of people are like, oh, how come I can buy a 4K phone but not a 4K VR headset? It's like, yeah. dude, because it's totally different. Like, <laughs> like you, Just nobody, nobody's going to go through the exercise of building a VR headset with that panel for you to understand why it's a bad <laughs> idea. Like, <laughs> it's like saying, how, how come I can buy a 12-cylinder muscle car but not a 12-cylinder Ford Fiesta or something? Yes. <laughs> yes. How big do you think the market's going to get with standalones? Standalone has always been the future. Like I've said this from the very, very beginning. The end game of virtual reality is that all of the compute is going to be on board. They're going to be specialized headsets with specialized render hardware that's made explicitly for virtual reality. Like, 100% for sure. It's the thing that is going to make it mainstream. Do you think that's next year? Uh, or do you think it's going to take <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't comment that specifically. I know too much. I asked John Carmack about this. Yep. And he said that it boiled down to the dollars and cents stuff that has to go into all of these headsets. If standalone is the obvious future, and eventually that merges together with whatever AR is, and you just got one device, is there ever a video in port on it? Uh, you mean like for rendering from external stuff? Yeah, for yeah, because I mean, pe people could do that. I think it's just a matter of market forces and also whether or not that's the right way to do it. The, if you build and optimize something around a display pipeline where everything is rendered on board, it's actually not trivial to mm -hmm. to say, oh, and we're going to take video input from another thing. Like, sure. it it is not it is not easy to do that. Uh, I think what you're actually more likely to see is really clever ways to render things uh, remotely and then stream them wirelessly to a headset. Not and not as raw video frames. Like all of this stuff about 
raw, like streaming raw video frames. Like, oh, let's use 60 gigahertz video links and a shitload of bandwidth. And we'll just stream every single raw frame. That's not the right way to stream content that's rendered. There are smarter ways that you can render things remotely and stream it to a device that can do a lot of the final processing on board and uh, do it with a lot less bandwidth. <clears throat> you think like 5G is an interesting part with the low latency, depending on how far the servers are on it depends. kilometers? I'm not a huge believer in like 5G cell deployment, personally. Yeah, I'm not sure. The problem is that the, like, the higher frequency you go, the, like, the higher frequency you go, the less penetration you get through all kinds of obstacles. And it's going to be a long time before 5G reaches the deployment density that we've seen with 4G. Like, you'll get it some places. You're going to get it walking down the major streets in San Francisco. You're going to get it in Times Square. But when it comes to even like being, you know, you're like, you'll probably get it in this convention center. They'll probably outfit <laughs> it with a bunch of repeaters. But like when it comes to actual real world use going out there, 5G has really got an uphill battle. I think so as well, yeah. Yeah, I could. I mean, like uh, this. Just so you know, like this is way out of my like, area of true expertise. <laughs> like, this is just me looking at the technology and just giving my opinion. But I think 5G's got a very steep road ahead of it, and it's not going to roll out as fast as people think. What, so, do you, right. what are you most hopeful for out of the big actors in the industry in the next couple of years? Yeah. Most hopeful for? Yeah. So I basically know what everyone's doing. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you well, most I, excited I, about? I'm worried about it because. Well, see, that's the problem. When yeah. you know, like. What, no, no, knowing it doesn't mean, like, when you know, it's actually harder to speculate. Because yeah. if I didn't know, I could just tell you what I hope they do and name a bunch of things. And, you know, maybe they do it, maybe they don't. But if I know, then I, it's much harder for me to be like, oh, what I, what I hope Sony does is this. Or what I hope HTC does is this. It's like, it's very Which one excites line. you the most? that you can't talk about, I'm sure, but <laughs> I mean, Look, I mean, who you, excites you the most? Well, we don't know that you know, we're just on some like, an so, so like, hope I, I, like, I, like, I can be a bit of an egotist, I'm most excited about my things, yeah. 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 but like, that's, but, but, like, it, that's why I'm working on it. Like, yeah, yeah. That's, it's one of those things. It's like, what are you most excited about? It's like my things. Like, why are you excited about other people too? It's like, yes, but if I was excited about the things that they were working on more than what I'm working on myself, then I would work on those things, and then it would still be the thing. That I'm working on. <laughs> How big a problem do you think these edge use cases are with tracking? If you can't get right behind the head, or mm -hmm. just one in a hundred? I mean, how many? How perfect does tracking need to be for? you'd have a really good experience uh, when we make this transition to standalone. The most important thing is that it's very reliable more than it, than it has no limitations. Like, if you can't ever get tracking right behind your head, that's not a huge problem as long as you consistently know that, developers consistently know that. Like, the things you can't have are, uh, you know, jumps in tracking when certain things happen in the environment, or things where it's, uh, like, moving through your field of view is causing hiccups, is causing hiccups in the tracking. Like, those are the things that have to be solved. When people say like, oh, well, you know, sh shouldn't you be able to like, you know, reach behind your back and you know, pull the katana out, you know, out of its sheath? It's like, look, that is really cool. Like, it's, <laughs> that's awesome. But if you can't do it perfectly, I'm okay with that as long as it's consistent and you're clear with developers. You say, look, you can't do that. Sorry, it's just the way it is. That's way better for to me than trying to do everything and and failing to do it reliably. Or saying, yeah, you can do everything, but it's going to cost you know, twice as much, or you have to put external sensors everywhere. Like the reality is that the thing that makes or breaks mainstream VR adoption is not going to be pulling katanas out of your back. It's like <laughs> it, 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 we can survive without those things. So, on the topic of things you're interested in, which is your stuff, and I yep. hear it involves uh, point clouds and voxel things, perhaps. Um, I have a new voxel engine that okay. I would love to show you when you start walking down here. Yeah, definitely. I have a demo so, going so, there. So, so I, I might be able to do that. Also, send me a Facebook yeah, message. Sure. I, I, maybe I can also run it on my own rig, too. Do so, you guys uh, have a build that's available or no? That, it, we are not setting it around. The only live demo is on mm. this machine over here. All right. It's something we worked on for 15 years and banged our head against. We can scale voxels. Which, which, where, where, where are you? We're right at this uh, white couch, the first one over there. It's all set up for you, so gotcha. you're ready. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ready? No, no, I'm yeah. looking around and saying I don't know what yeah. it's going to be. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be there. yeah, whatever. You know, I'm gonna be there for a while. So, um, but yeah, it's it's we're, we scale to billions of voxels at VR speeds. So, cool. My, my Peter said. No, I want to check it out for sure. Sweet. A quick question. Yeah. So you said like, you know you know what everybody is doing, right? What do I, you like, think? I, I, I'm, that's exaggerating a little. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? I'm how impressive. future is being navigated? How do I think of it? I'm very I'm very optimistic. I think almost everybody is doing the right thing. And what do you think about the tools that 
I think he speaks for himself. <laughs> okay. How bullish are you on foveated rendering in that like near to mid? Uh, I'm mildly pessimistic. Okay. Uh, I think that eye tracking, getting eye tracking right, is an absolute necessity for doing foveated rendering, and. The eye tracking stuff that's out there is super, super interesting, but there's a big difference between making it work in a lab environment and making it work when you, you know, perfectly put this thing on every person's head right. and having a dynamically self, like a dynamic self calibrating system that's able to continuously make eye tracking work and be precise enough for foveated rendering for everybody with all their different facial geometries, right. all of their different pupil. Oh, yeah. It's like that, that's, that's a really big product challenge. Okay. So, like, I, I told in the, in the long term, yeah. I'm very, very, like, it's obviously right. good. It just obviously is the thing to do. Uh, in the near term, I'm 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 kind of pessimistic. Okay. Yeah, the SMI, I saw the SMI two years ago, and on the uh, GVR, that mm -hmm. was really you know, the box demo it was really good, actually. For sure. my, maybe for my face, just well, my... so it, it, it's not just your face, but also like. Uh, like did I'm, just, well also like yeah. so you, you put it on your head you probably ran through the calibration routine yes. and then how long did you play because no, 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 no. so let's say so, 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 so yeah so then like what do you do when it shifts even you know a few millimeters on your head and now mm. it's off now the uh, now the calibration is completely off okay. um, and then also like especially when you've got active yeah. gameplay like it's one thing where it's like oh look like slowly this thing so, like, <laughs> yeah, what about when you're playing something like echo arena and it, there is significant <laughs> shift on your head like the, the right way to design head-mounted displays is to increase the exit pupil uh, and increase the eye box so that it can, so you don't have to clamp it to your face so tightly to keep it perfectly aligned. And eye tracking is kind of right now the opposite, the opposite path. Uh, so what you really need is a system that can dynamically recalibrate and you know look at your eyes and actually basically get a stereo image of each eye and their spacing relative to each other and calculate exactly exactly what it needs to do to compensate in real time. And that, that stuff is not, it's not really deployable just yet. Have you tried Neurable? Yeah. What did you think? Uh, I'd say I put them in the same box as Pimax, where I don't really want to say too much one way or the other, because it's really early for them. Mm. And if I, if, if I give too much, if I give too much of my impression, then it'll, it'll get associated with them unfairly too long. Like, I think it is really interesting. Uh, I'm, like I, I, I like BCI technology at that level. I'm anti BCI once it gets a little, once it gets a little, like I'm fine with. They're not scary where they currently are, <laughs> <laughs> and so I like that. <laughs> it's a really good way of looking at it. Yeah. 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 Um, they, the reason I asked was it uses eye tracking, and it's hard to figure out how much of that is driven by eye tracking versus actually reading Here's my brain. The question: Does it really matter? If they make you think that it's all brain interaction because they do such a good job of training, like, if, you know, if you if you can train your neural net off a bunch of different sources and it's able to give you the outcome that you believe is it just reading your mind, it's all the same to me. Like, I'm not a tech fetishist always. Like, I, <laughs> like, like if, 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 if it's using eye tracking, like, for all I care, it's, uh, like, for all I care, if it's also got, you know, a drone flying around me and watching my muscles twitch too and it feeds that in, like, I don't, I don't care how it does it. Personally, the drone side is an interesting one. No, I'm, 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 I was trying to think of something. I'm no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I, I, I'm totally fine with merging BCI type stuff and uh, eye tracking. If if it works well and it feels good, it doesn't really matter if it's 80% eye tracking and 20% BCI. I got a question for you, Paul. Sure. Related to streaming, actually, with these all-in-one headsets, taking video feeds off from these all-in-one devices and actually broadcasting them, 